Welcome to our service this morning. Um, my name is Kevin Oates. I'm glad that uh, you could join us today to worship the Lord together. Uh, and that's what we're here for, uh, to lift up the name of Christ, to worship Him, uh, to hear from His Word. And so uh, let's pray and ask God to bless our time. Father, thank you for this day. Thanks, God, that we could come together. Thank you that uh, uh, although we're not together physically, but in spirit we are, and we can together worship you uh, from our homes, uh, from wherever we are at. Lord, and thank you that uh, you've given us your word. I pray that you would teach us and help us to grow closer to you, uh, that our lives would glorify and honor you in, in every area. Um, make our commitment to you stronger, Lord. Help our love for you to be greater. In Christ's name, amen. Welcome to our service. Uh, please pray with me, and then we're going to do some worship. Jesus, thank you for your love that you have given us. Thank you for the kindness that you have bestowed upon us and the way that you uh, interact with us and the way that you call us to love the people um, of this world. Holy Spirit, please be in this place. Please fill our hearts as we sing praise and as we listen to the words that you have given um, Kevin to say to us today. Lord, just please be with us and have us go out into the world after today and love your people well. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. You wrote the story of my life. You wrote the story of my life. You go before you. It's way too hot to 
the highest place you are worthy amazing love how can it be far too wonderful for me there's only one thing left to say you are worthy
Well, we're here to uh, continue our study of uh, the Word of God. The uh, theme and the topic we've been looking at for the past uh, three weeks has been the Scriptures, the truth that transforms. And we've, we've seen uh, from that great passage in 2 Timothy 3, 5, 3, 16 and 17 that the Word of God is inspired. Uh, it is God-breathed. And uh, because of that, it's authoritative. Uh, also, uh, it is absolutely true, and so we can trust it. Uh, we've seen that, that the Bible also uh, is beneficial for us spiritually because it teaches us, reproves us, corrects us, and trains us in righteousness. And we desperately need that. Uh, we're all sinners in process, and, and God, through His Word, uh, uses that to change us and transform us. We've also seen that the Bible prepares us for every good work. Anything that God wants us to do, uh, He has given us everything we need in the Scriptures to prepare us to do that. And last week, we looked at the sufficiency of Scripture, uh, that it is sufficient to meet all of our uh, spiritual needs. And, and really, uh, if we are going to benefit from all of what the Scripture is and what it does for us, uh, we need to know how to tap into that. And a lot of, uh, I think a lot of Christians get confused or kind of hung up at this point, not knowing what to do with the Bible. Yes, you read it, and uh, they know you should read it and study it, but, but how do you actually do that? And, and how can we do that in a way that's consistent and in a way that is going to be effective, that's going to help us to grow spiritually? What are some practical things that we can do so we can take advantage of the spiritual treasure that God has given to us in His Word? Uh, this problem of not knowing what to do can be solved simply by uh, just knowing what to do. And today I'm going to kind of uh, take more of a role of a teacher as, uh, as opposed to a preacher. And we're just going to look at, at some practical tips on reading and studying the Bible so that we can take advantage of the great spiritual treasure that we have in this book. And so uh, how can we tap into uh, the spiritual riches of the Bible? And there's really two things that I want to uh, focus on today that will help each one of us to grow in our understanding of Scripture, but really to grow in our Christ-likeness as we are allowing our, ourselves to be exposed to the Word of God. And so the first thing that we can do uh, to help us to tap into the spiritual riches of the Bible is simply to read it, uh, to read the Bible, to read it systematically, uh, to read it consistently. And, and really, it seems pretty basic, um, but if we're going to get the most from God's Word, we just need to start by reading it. Uh, and, and this cannot be emphasized enough. There are a lot of Bible study programs and methods out there, but there's nothing that can replace just simply reading through the Bible. Uh, and that really is the, the basic, fundamental, uh, foundational principle that we, we need to incorporate into our lives as a consistent reading of the Scriptures. Other methods of Bible study will be of limited benefit if we don't have a good understanding of, of the whole teaching of the Bible. And so the best way to do this uh, is to have a plan to read through the Bible. Uh, best is to have a plan to read through it uh, in a year, which isn't a whole, doesn't really require that much time. And I think there, there are a lot of read the Bible in a year programs that are out there. Uh, some are complicated, some are uh, more simple. But I just want to share with you a basic, uh, a basic method and plan to do that that I think is very simple uh, and it, it leaves room for days that you miss and that kind of thing. So first of all, best, best thing to do is just to read through. Uh, Old Testament, read through the Old Testament from Genesis and just work your way all the way through the book of Malachi. And at the same time as you're doing that, you read through the New Testament, starting in Matthew, and moving all the way through Revelation. Old Testament has 929 chapters, and so if you uh, break that down over a year, that's two and a half chapters a day. Uh, but uh, better to just up that to three chapters a day, and then that gives you a cushion for the days throughout the year that you might miss because you're sick or uh, unforeseen things come up where you're not able to read so that you don't have to go back and read double the next day. You just pick up where you left off and you keep on going. Same, and that, that basically, Old Testament, reading three chapters, you're only talking 10 or 15 minutes. It's, it's not a whole lot of time. New Testament, same, same idea. 
Uh, there's 260 chapters in the New Testament, so it's less than a chapter a day to read through the New Testament. But again, if you just make it one chapter, New Testament, that's like five minutes, you'll be able to have room for days that you miss, and you won't have to double up on days or anything like that. And so if you miss a day, you just pick up where you left off. That is a simple, basic plan for reading the Bible in a year. Three chapters in the Old Testament, one chapter in the New Testament, and you're only talking 15, max 20 minutes a day. Uh, not a whole lot of time. Uh, I think every single person can sacrifice 15, 20 minutes a day to better understanding God's Word and to read through the Scriptures in a year. And as you read, a couple things. Uh, have a pen or pencil in hand to mark verses that stand out to you, uh, verses that, are, that, that God really uses to speak to you, uh, maybe convict you of something or maybe something that you learn. Highlight those verses, maybe underline them, write a note in the margin, or keep a journal of those particular verses and write something down that God's teaching you through it. Um, also, use a pencil and anything that you're reading that you don't understand or that's completely puzzling to you, just write in the margin a question mark. Don't sit on that passage until you understand it. Just keep on reading uh, because the whole idea of reading from uh, cover to cover in the Bible is to get a broad overview. And what you'll notice if you do this yearly is next time you go back through the Bible, some of those question marks you're just going to erase because you're like, oh yeah, I understand what that means now because it said something like that later on in the Bible. Because what that's going to do, you're going to see your understanding of Scripture grow uh, so that those questions are going to be answered as you go along and as your understanding of Scripture grows as well. And so really, first thing, if you want to get the most from God's Word, just read it. Read it consistently. Uh, let the Word of God dwell in you richly and let your mind be transformed and renewed, and your life will totally be transformed. Guarantee it. Second thing, not only read the Bible, uh, but study the Bible. And this, this uh, can be complicated. Uh, some people have a very complicated way of studying the Bible, but let me try to make it as simple as possible uh, for us. Uh, the difference between reading the Bible and studying the Bible can be seen in like if you go up to a lake and if you jump on a boat and you want to look at the lake you cruise around full speed going fast you see the different coves different beaches uh, different details of the lake maybe you see a waterfall coming into the lake uh, maybe you see the river that feeds the lake or there might be a dam on one part of the lake that keeps it there uh, that's kind of like reading the bible you get a broad overview of the bible you kind of see see some of the things that are there um, but it's, it's just a broad overview. Uh, studying the Bible would be like going out on that boat, looking at one of those coves, and then putting on some scuba gear and diving in. That's when you're going to look at the details of what's below the surface. Maybe you see fish, maybe you see plant life, maybe you find a, a, uh, an underground, underwater cave or something like that. But that's more of studying the Bible. Studying the Bible gives us details that you don't get when you just read. And so, it's important because we need those rich details of Bible study. Reading the Bible is great and we need to do that, but it's also good for us to get into the details of Scripture to see what God has to say. So three basic steps to studying the Bible. And this is, this is uh, like an inductive Bible study method. Maybe some of you have, have read on that or maybe taken classes on that. Inductive Bible study basically is using the Bible as the textbook, the primary resource. You're not looking at commentaries much or anything else. You're just sticking with Scripture. Um, and how you do this, there's three basic steps. Uh, observation, interpretation, and application. Observation tells us uh, what the Bible says. It answers the question, what does the Bible say, or what does this passage say? Interpretation answers the question, what does this passage mean? Application answers the question, how does this apply to my life? And so those three basic steps are key to having a, a, a good Bible study time. Let's look at observation very quickly, some things that you can keep in mind as, as you do that. Really, this is the most important step in the process of studying the Bible, simply because you're observing what the passage is actually saying. Most uh, interpretations that are wrong are a neglect of observing what the passage actually says. And so it's important to, to recognize that 
Wrong interpretations also will lead to wrong applications. Uh, we'll look at examples of that later. But um, first thing you need to do if you want to study the Bible, uh, I would recommend choosing a, you got to choose a book. Remember the Bible was written to us in books. And so you should choose a book. Best thing it, to do would probably be to start with a short book like 1 John, uh, 1 Peter, Philippians, Colossians, something like that. And what you want to do with, with that is just read the book over and over again. Uh, sit down, read through it in one sitting, and do that for a number of days until you feel comfortable with uh, the contents. You understand a little bit of the, of the different themes, the sections of the book. Uh, in, if you go to Bible college or seminary, professors are going to tell you if you want to know a book of the Bible, you should read it once a day for minimum 30 days. Now, you don't have to go that far. If you want to, that'd be awesome. Believe me, you would benefit from that. But read it over and over until you, get a, uh, until you feel comfortable with the book and the contents and what's in there, kind of the themes of the book. And then start from chapter 1, verse 1. Take that first paragraph, and you need to study paragraph by paragraph because each paragraph has its own basic theme, uh, basic content and thrust and message, and that's what we should be studying. And so look at that first paragraph read it over and over again, and ask questions. Remember, this is kind of like an investigation. You're, you're asking questions about the passage and what it's saying. Remember, you're not interpreting yet. You're just seeing what it's actually saying. Um, you may have heard the, the, the questions, the five W's and an H, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Those are questions you should ask of the text. For example, who's writing this? Who's saying this? Who is, uh, why is he saying this? Why is he writing this? Who is he writing to? What's the main idea of the passage? What is he telling them to do? When did this happen? Why did this happen? Um, how does he want a, his readers to do this? Many, many questions to ask the text to understand what it's actually saying. Uh, another thing that you do during this process is to highlight repeated words or phrases or repeated ideas in the text because those things are the, that's going to kind of trigger you to see what the theme of the passage actually is. For example, Hebrews 11, that phrase, by faith, is used at least 19 different times, and that tells us what the theme of that chapter is. It is the walk of faith, living by faith. Many examples in that passage of men and women who lived by faith. Uh, another example, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, the phrase is repeated over and over again, in Christ or in Him, in the Beloved. And really that passage is talking about the spiritual riches that we have in Christ and our union with Him. Another great example of, of repeated words that indicate the theme of the passage, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 21, the word love is used uh, 26 times, which obviously the passage is about love. God's love, but also the love that we need to have for one another. And so highlight those things so that you can get an understanding of what the passage is, is talking about. So that's observation. Once you feel like you've done that and you kind of have a good grasp of what the passage is saying, next you move into interpretation, which answers the question, what does it mean? And there's a few principles that we need to keep in mind as we interpret. And these are, these are I mean, there's, there's many but I've kind of narrowed it down to four that are extremely helpful and kind of priority. Uh, number one, first principle when, in interpretation is to interpret literally uh, or interpret in its normal sense. The words and sentences of the Bible are to be understood in their normal sense, uh, the way that words are understood in normal human communication. That means taking the Bible at face value. If the normal sense makes sense, seek no other sense. Uh, there's no reason to try to find some hidden meaning in Scripture. To interpret literally means to understand the words of Scripture in their normal, natural, and customary sense, just as one would understand any other book or writing or verbal communication. Uh, and some, you might, the question might come up, well, doesn't the Bible use symbolic language and figures of speech? Yes, it does, and literal interpretation doesn't ignore those things. Uh, it actually leaves room, leaves room for symbols, figures of speech, and understands them in their natural sense, consistent with the literary form and the context of the passage. And usually, when there is a figure of speech or uh, symbolism being used, it's 90% of the time it's obvious what is being referred to and what it means. For example, 
Uh, John chapter 1, verse 29. The, uh, John the Baptist says, he looks at Jesus and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, when John said that, did he mean that he was looking at an actual lamb with four feet and wool that was saying, bah? No. Obviously, in the context, there's no way that you can come to that conclusion. It was obviously symbolic language indicating that Jesus was the lamb who was going to bear the sins of the world and die for them. And so, it's so obvious. Normally, figures of speech, symbols are extremely obvious, uh, very easy to recognize. Another example is John 10, 9, where Jesus says, I am the door. Well, if we take that literally, does that mean that Jesus is made of wood, mahogany or pine or oak or something like that? Well, obviously not. Uh, that's symbolic. He's saying that I'm the door into the sheepfold, which means if you're going to get into the sheepfold, that is, into eternal life, you have to go through him. And so symbols, figures of speech, normally are extremely obvious, and it's not hard to figure out what they mean. So literal interpretation uh, basically means that you take it literally unless that literal sense is absurd or ridiculous. Simple. If the normal sense makes sense, seek no other sense. And, and here it's, it's important to, to step back and just think, don't allegorize the text. Uh, this is, I, mean, I, I lived in Latin America for many, many years and uh, ministered there as a missionary and uh, allegorizing passages, finding some deeper hidden meaning in a passage that really isn't there was very common. Uh, let me give you examples of what that looks like. <laughs> Uh, for example, Nehemiah, book of Nehemiah. Remember this guy, Nehemiah, uh, comes down and, uh, to Jerusalem and helps rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, an allegorization of that uh, would be Nehemiah represents the Holy Spirit, Jerusalem represents the church, and the walls represents the Word of God. And ne the Holy Spirit protects the church with the Word of God. Now that preach is great and it sounds really spiritual, but that's not what those things mean. Nehemiah was a guy. Jerusalem was a city, an actual city. It doesn't mean anything more than that. The walls were walls made of stone. It doesn't mean anything beyond that. Uh, allegorizing tries to make something up that isn't actually there. Another great example of this, and I heard this uh, from, from some of my students down in, in uh, Honduras, uh, David and Goliath. Remember David, uh, he went to a little creek and he grabbed five stones. And that was what he was going to bring to use in his sling to, to defeat Goliath. Well, uh, some have said, well, those five stones represent five different uh, virtues. Could be love, courage, joy, peace, and righteousness. And if we have those things, we can defeat the enemy. Uh, others, I've heard say, uh, those five stones represent five, the five ministries in the church. You have apostle, prophet, teacher, pastor, and evangelist. If you've got those five uh, ministries going on in your church, then you can defeat the enemy. Well, that sounds spiritual and it sounds really neat and everything, but that's not what those five stones mean. I'll give you the secret. You know what they mean? There's five rocks. That's it. Doesn't mean anything beyond that. There were five stones that David picked up to throw at Goliath. Nothing more. To say it's more than that uh, goes beyond what the text actually says, and that's, that's uh, really not a, a good practice to have because you're saying that God's Word says something and means something when it actually doesn't. And so avoid allegorizing, but interpret literally. Second principle, real important. Uh, interpret in light of context. And I think every one of us... Uh, knows the consequences of something being taken out of context, whether it's something you've said that was taken out of context and used wrongly. People do that with the Bible as well. It's important to recognize that in interpretation, context is king, always. Uh, the vast majority of wrong interpretations are the result of ignoring context in one way or another. Uh, there are a lot of different contexts. Uh, you start with the passage you're studying, that's the immediate context. Uh, the broader context would be the paragraphs before and after. Then you have the context of the entire book, the context in the New Testament, the context of the entire Bible. So there's many different contexts. It's like, it's like the layers of an onion. You have to consider all of those things. Uh, 
And if you ignore the context, really, you can make the Bible say anything that you want it to. Uh, for example, great example of this, Job chapter 2, verse 9. Do you realize that there is a command in Scripture that says, curse God and die? That's a command given to us in the Scripture. There's also a command in 1 Corinthians 15, 32 that says, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Hey, man, we're commanded to live it up because we're just going to die. Now, those are kind of obvious examples of taking something out of context. Um, in Job 2.9, that's Job's wife's words to, J to Job. Job, who, was, who refused to speak evil of God after all those things took place, all of his losses and suffering, she says, curse God and die. And Job says, you're speaking like a foolish woman. Uh, you're, speaking, you're speaking like a foolish woman. Uh, can we, do we receive good from God and not bad? And so that's not what that passage means. It doesn't mean, hey, let's curse God and die. No, that was the words of somebody else. It would be wrong and sinful to do that. Same thing in 1 Corinthians 15, 32. It says, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Paul's only saying that because if the resurrection is not taking place, if Christ did not rise from the dead, we're not going to rise from the dead either. Therefore, there's no afterlife. So let's live it up here because we're going to die. So you can... Take anything out of context and uh, make it say whatever it is that you want it to say. But we need to interpret Scripture in its context so that we can have really what God is actually saying. So very important, very important concept. That's exactly what false teachers and cults do. They take things out of context and teach them that way. Uh, that's why we got to be very careful about the context. So interpret literally, interpret in light of context, and also... Uh, interpret in light of other passages of Scripture. That's cross-referencing. Interpret in light of other passages of Scripture. A uh, cross-reference is a, a, another Scripture that supports, illumines, or amplifies the Scripture that you're studying. In other words, when you cross-reference, you're comparing Scripture with Scripture. And remember, Scripture is the best commentary on Scripture. And so, uh, cross-referencing. Cross-reference as many truths or principles as you can. Uh, use the tool in your Bible. Most Bibles have a, a, a on each page have a list of cross references for each verse. Uh, look those up and see if any of those cross references shed any light on the verse that you're studying. The more difficult passages, the more difficult, uh, obscure, unclear passages should be interpreted in light of the more clear passages. And so, get a concordance if you need to. Uh, a reference tool, uh, oftentimes a topical. Topical reference tool is a, a good place to go. Um, the great one is the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge. That has cross-references for every single verse, and there are many, many of them for each verse. That's a good tool to have. But cross-reference. Check, uh, compare Scripture with Scripture so that you can see uh, maybe that another passage explains it a little bit differently than the passage you're studying. For example, this whole uh, Galatians 2.20 when it says, I have been crucified with Christ. What does that mean to be crucified with Christ? Well, there are other passages in which Paul refers to that. Romans chapter 6 is one. Uh, Colossians chapter 3 talks about that also. So you want to look at all of what the Scripture says about that particular thing to bring light to it, to illuminate it, uh, to give you better understanding of what that passage is actually saying. So you want to cross-reference. So you want to interpret literally, interpret in light of context, and cross-reference. And then number four, interpret in light of theological consistency, or what's often referred to as the analogy of the faith. Interpret in light of theological consistency. That basically, that just means that there's only one unified, consistent, and harmonious system of teaching in the Bible. Uh, in other words, no verse correctly interpreted is going to uh, contradict another verse. Uh, scripture is not going to contradict uh, itself. A proposed interpretation must be tested by Scripture to determine uh, if it contradicts what the Scripture clearly teaches. So it's kind of like a checking principle. When you've made your interpretation, check and see if the Bible is consistent in teaching this. Uh, if it contradicts a passage of Scripture, then you need to go back and think through your interpretation. Great example of this. Uh, James, uh, James chapter 2, verse 24 says, 
A man is justified by works and not by faith alone. If your interpretation of that is, man, if I, get, need, if I want to get to heaven, I need to do good works and have faith. I, I've got to have works and faith or God's not going to accept me. If that's your interpretation, you're going to find in Romans chapter 3, verse 28, the Apostle Paul says a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law, which means works contribute nothing in our standing before God. Well, how do we work that out? Well, if uh, the James passage isn't speaking about our justification before God, he's talking about faith without works is dead. Uh, if you say you have faith, but you don't have works, your faith is not saving faith. So he's talking about something different than the Apostle Paul is talking about. James is focusing on, hey, if you say you have faith, but you have no works, your faith is completely useless. It's not valid. How are you justified in the sense here? If you have works that declares and shows and proves that your faith is genuine. That's the difference. And so you want to compare uh, other teachings of the scripture to make sure it's not contradicting something that is clearly taught somewhere else. And so, uh, once you've gone through observation and you've kind of gone through interpretation and you understand what the passage is saying, uh, it is good uh, to find, to use good tools, a uh, good study Bible like ESV study Bible, MacArthur study Bible, NIV study Bible, good tool to kind of look at the comments on, on those passages uh, that you're studying. Um, uh, commentaries, if you pick the right ones, are very helpful. Uh, there are bad commentaries out there, uh, but there are a lot of good ones too. Um, but the goal is to focus on the scripture and learn as much as you possibly can on your own before you turn to any other of those resources. And so, once you've done the interpretive process, it's time to look at the application. What does this, how does this apply to my life? And really, this is the goal of Bible study. The goal of Bible study isn't to know and to have a correct interpretation of a passage. That's not the goal. We need that. We definitely need that, but that's not the end goal. The end goal is to apply it to our lives, that our lives would be transformed by it. Once you've studied the passage, it's time to think through and to meditate on how it applies to you personally in many different aspects and ways and areas of your life. And Bible study isn't complete until you've actually done that. God wants us to be doers of the word, not just hearers. He doesn't want us to just know the truth. He wants us to live the truth. And so this is the time where you slow down, you stop, and you pray through and think through how this applies to my life. Um, as you meditate on that and, and uh, think through what the passage teaches, ask yourself some questions. These are kind of application questions. Um, is there a command in this passage that I need to obey? Is there a sin in this passage that I need to avoid? Uh, is there a promise in this passage that I need to apply and to claim that promise? Uh, is there an example to follow? Is there a warning against false teaching of any kind in this passage? Uh, is there a basic doctrinal truth about God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, man, sin, salvation, Satan, angels, end times? Is there any doctrinal truth that I need to believe and embrace in this passage? And so asking yourselves these questions is helpful to think through how it actually applies. How does it apply as a father? Or how does it apply as a mother? How does this apply in my family, in my workplace? There's so many ways that the scripture can apply. There's one interpretation that's correct, but there are many applications of that truth. And so you ask yourself these questions, you think about those, and you spend time praying and asking God to help you to put those things into practice. And that is, an, in a nutshell, a basic Bible study method. And so if we're going to tap into... Uh, the spiritual riches that are found in God's Word. We need to read it uh, consistently, systematically. We need to study it and have a plan on how to do that. Um, and, and the question comes up then, what are you going to do? Uh, are you willing to sacrifice the time to actually read the Bible and study the Bible? Uh, remember, reading through the Bible in a year, 15 20 minutes max, that's not much. Uh, do you need to sacrifice some TV time, PlayStation time? Uh, do you need to sacrifice 
a show that you watch or something else that you do in order to spend that time in God's Word, uh, believe me, the sacrifice that you make to spend more time in God's Word uh, is well worth it. God is going to use it to transform your life. And so I would say pray about what you need to give up, what you need to set aside in order to spend time in God's Word because there's nothing that's going to change and transform your life like spending time in the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your Word. Lord, as we uh, consider how important it is for us to be in your Word, I just pray, God, that you would put within us a longing, a hunger and thirst uh, to spend time with you, to hear your voice as we read your Word. Lord, help us to put it into practice. God, help us to be willing to sacrifice those things that really don't even matter compared to the eternal reward and eternal, eternal blessing that we receive as we read your word. Lord, help us to be willing to put the time into that. Uh, help us to be willing to do that so that we can know you better and so our lives would be transformed, that we become more and more like Christ as we uh, study your word. And so, Lord, I pray that you would uh, do that in each one of us. Uh, give us that hunger and thirst. Help us to uh, be committed to your word. Lord, that we would see the transformation that takes place as a result of that. And all of that for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to take communion. And so um, if you need to take a couple minutes to get the elements ready for yourself, then uh, go ahead and pause. Um, and we will uh, pick it up when you, you can pick it up as, when you get back. Uh, let's uh, open our Bibles. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to open to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11. And here, uh, the Apostle Paul is addressing the, the issue of the Lord's Supper in the Corinthian church. Uh, they had abused it. They had uh, turned it into a, a time of uh, feasting for selfish gain, uh, neglecting those who were hungry, uh, indulging in, in uh, a lot of different uh, things, the food and the drink, and some were actually getting drunk there. Uh, seems like, how could that possibly happen? <laughs> but hey, they were the Corinthians, man. You look at what they did, the things that Paul wrote about them, uh, it shouldn't surprise us that those things were taking place. So Paul writes to correct that. And, here's, and he gives us the teaching about the Lord's Supper right here. That's why this passage is usually the passage that, that pastors will read because it is the teaching about it. So let's read in verse 23. It says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also, after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. A couple of observations here. Notice he repeats, Jesus repeats that twice, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. The focus of the institution of the Lord's Supper, why we do communion specifically is for remembering what Christ has done for us, to have a vivid, vivid picture of Christ and his suffering for us. We have the physical bread. We have the physical cup with the juice. Uh, these are supposed to be vivid reminders to us of what Jesus did for us. Uh, and so because he said, do this in remembrance of me, indicates that we are forgetful people. We are. Uh, I, I think we would probably feel ashamed at how little we actually think of Christ and what he did for us on the cross on a daily basis. That should be the central thought in our mind. What he did for us on the cross every single day, that should be on our mind constantly, praising God for it, thanking him for his sacrifice. But we're forgetful people, and this is why he has instituted this, so that we could come together as a body, although we can't be physically together, but in spirit we are, uh, and to remember together what Jesus did for us on that cross. The other thing, another observation in verse 26, 
It says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so the, the Lord's table is a proclamation, really, of the gospel. Uh, when we are partaking in the Lord's Supper, we are proclaiming and saying, we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and he is the only way a person can be saved. And that is absolutely true. Uh, you might be watching and you don't know Christ. Maybe this is something new that you've never uh, seen before. Uh, or maybe you don't know the Lord and you've kind of watched this happen many times. But you need to understand that what Jesus did on the cross in dying there, it was to take upon himself the sins of man and pay the penalty that we could never pay. He bore our sins in his body on the cross. He took the cup of wrath. He bore God's wrath on the cross to pay the penalty that we could never pay. And that is why we celebrate this. That's why we do this, to remember that. And we do it corporately so that as a church, this remains our focus. Our focus isn't on buildings. Our focus isn't on expanding. Our focus should be first and foremost on the gospel, on Jesus Christ and him crucified. That should be the focus of the church. That should be the focus of our lives individually and corporately as a church. And so um, as, we, as we take the uh, elements, uh, we do this to remember Christ. And so I would say, um, take the bread. Uh, let me read the verse again. He said he took the bread. He broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take the bread. Uh, remember what he did in his body being broken for you. It also says in the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So let's take the, take the cup. Christ's blood poured out for you and for me. That blood, as we see in the Old Testament, the life is in the blood. The blood of Jesus was poured out. His life was poured out for us. Uh, let's pray and thank him for that. Lord Jesus, we praise you and thank you that you came and you died for sinners like us. We don't deserve it. Lord, we, um, we don't remember and think about the cross as we ought to. But Lord, I thank you for being willing to go to the cross and to pour out your life, to be bruised, beaten, pierced, mocked, shamed for sinners like us. Uh, we don't deserve it. And we thank you for it. Lord, thank you for your great love displayed in that act for us. Lord, forgive us for not remembering you uh, more frequently, for not having you on our minds throughout the day. Uh, help us to change that. Lord, help us to uh, have you on our thoughts and what you did for us constantly in our minds, that we would be praising you and worshiping you all day long. Uh, Lord, we thank you for giving us this uh, Lord's Supper communion to remember. And thank you so much for allowing us uh, to have access to the Father through you. Um, Lord, we look forward to the day where we uh, will be with you. And uh, we know that we can only be there because of what you did for us. And so, Lord, we long for that day. And we pray together, uh, Lord, come. And we proclaim your death until you do come, and we look forward to that day. Lord, help us to live for your glory and for your honor, and to proclaim this death, uh, the gospel, uh, to those around us. We pray it in your name. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Um, we will uh, see you soon, next week. Thanks.